Well, hello, and it's uh, good to see you, or good to be seen. It's uh, good that we can gather and have a look at Mark chapter 5 a little bit together at church, uh, or however you're looking at this recording. And of course, we're looking forward very greatly to the time when we can meet all in church together and sing and uh, share fellowship around the uh, Christ that we trust. But we're going to have a look at chapter 5, the first 20 ch verses of chapter 5 of Mark's Gospel right now. Um, and the good news is here that we get to talk about good news. But because I was thinking about good news, I was also thinking about bad news. And it came to mind this week, for me anyway, what happens when someone has to hear bad news about a COVID test, for example? You know, they're doing thousands of COVID tests all around Australia and Sydney is trying to test everybody, or I don't know how many. What? How do people get the bad news after a COVID test? I wonder how it works. I, I haven't heard anyone get that sort of result, a negative. Do they get a personal call and say, oh, look, I'm, I've got some news to tell you. It is serious. Your test has come back to... Or do they just get a, an impersonal text message saying, positive, stay at home, don't infect anyone? How does it work? How, how would you prefer to get the bad news if that you were COVID positive, if you'd been tested? How would you like to hear the bad news? Now, I have no knowledge of the COVID test result methods, especially for those who test positive. But um, I think it is worth us thinking as Christians, as a church, thinking about bad news. Now, what is the bad news in this world? How serious is it? Or we can ask, in other words, how bad is bad and how evil is evil? Are these things that we can think about, should think about, should have an idea? Well, before I read some verses from that uh, passage in Mark chapter 5, uh, we've already heard read, but before I read some more again, um, here's a suggestion. A suggestion to keep us to keep in mind, test it. Um, don't just believe me because I'm saying it now, but put it, put it to the test. Here's a suggestion. Evil is basically destruction. Evil, evil all it can do is twist and damage things. That's all it can do. Um, evil is limited. All it can do is break and smash things. So keep that in mind, and I'll read a few verses from uh, Mark chapter 5 again, from verse 2. When Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but... He wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Here we meet a man in a bad place. A man in a bad place. Literally in a bad place, because the tombs. The tombs are actually made for dead people. Um, you probably knew that already. And I imagine this man and the people in the region that he was living in, over the other side of the lake from the land of Israel, they knew that that was the case too. And dead people, especially we find out through the Old Testament, dead people, for those practicing the Jewish faith, were unclean. There's an uncleanness, a kind of corruption to the world where there's a dead body that's been lying or touched or um, uh, infecting, if you like, an area. Uh, religiously unclean, that is, not just uh, medically unclean. Um, and also, the region we're in is across the lake. As I said, Jesus and those with him have crossed the lake into Gentile, non-Jewish land. Therefore, places that were unclean, places that were not uh, where the Jewish faith was uh, practiced, where the cleansing rituals and the uh, food laws were obeyed. So here's this man in the tombs, a place of uncleanness, in a region across the lake, a place of uncleanness. And what's, what's the description of the spirit or the spirits that are within him? Unclean. As a man with an unclean spirit. Now, for the Jewish people, and for Jesus, the King of the Jews, this whole religious setting, it stinks. Perhaps you could say literally it stinks. It just smells of being against what God wants. It's unclean, it's polluted, it's evil, and it's corrupted by sin. Sin has seeped into it, into the very marrow of this place. So we are in a place of bad and bad news. That's what it's like there. Now, this unclean spirit in the man, it had power, but only power to 
break. You know, there were broken chains and shackles. The man seemed to have some extra human, superhuman strength that he couldn't be held down or restrained by anybody. And then the man himself seems broken, doesn't he? Verse 5, night and day among the tombs and on the mountains. He was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Doesn't sound, doesn't sound too pleasant for the fella. It sounds pretty scary for the neighbourhood as well, for whoever may have been in that region. Self-harm and self-damage, they're such a tragic reality for this man, such a tragic experience for many people. The, the man is he's really a man, but his humanity has been so overpowered that the normal human powers in him have been directed to hurt himself. You know, he's got these incoherent screams. I'm assuming he's incoherent because when they find him fixed by Jesus, he's in his right mind, they say, like he can talk normally. So he goes through the hills in the dark, screaming and shouting, terrifying people, maybe even terrifying himself. Um, so it's not only his language that's been turned around to be something that's um, broken and ineffective, but also his basic, the basic instinct of humans to use tools. He's using rocks as some simple tools, but to hurt himself. The basic human impulse to use tools is damaging his own skin. You see what I mean? That he's, that he's broken, he's hurting, he's, his powers have been twisted against themselves. And there's more de destruction soon in this story, say from verse 11 to 13, after the Jesus and the man have begun to interact. Now there was a great herd of pigs feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, that's the demons in the man, they begged him saying, Send us into the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned by the sea, drowned in the sea. The spirits begged to continue doing their native work, actually. The spirits begged to continue on the path that they were already on. Uh, but they begged to do it in the pigs instead of in the man. The native work of those spirits was harm and death and destruction. Now the spirit or the spirits called legion prove that evil's desire is to harm and hurt. They wanted to do it to the man. They hadn't quite succeeded in absolutely destroying him. But they kind of reached their fulfilment, if you like, in damaging, hurting, drowning these 2,000 pigs. Now, here's an idea that um, goes back quite a few centuries, probably 16, 1700 years. Here's an idea that I think coheres with this passage and fits nicely. The idea is this. Evil doesn't exist. Evil does not exist. That evil instead is just a parasite on reality. Evil is like a leech sucking the marrow, the good stuff, out of creation. There is no reality to evil, no power to evil. It can't make anything. All it can do is break things. Um, all that sin and evil can do is take something good from God and twist it out of shape. The beauty of speech, for example, is turned to screams. The capacity to use tools is flipped into self-harm. Um, instead of farming pigs into life in a herd, evil sends those pigs to death in the waters at the bottom of a steep slope. You see, there, there is nothing too evil. It doesn't have an existence in, in its own. You know, all it can do is grab something good and break it. To be honest, I, I quite often think of this definition as I walk down the, the footpath and bike path. If I see people have smashed a light bulb in the in the um, council lights, I think, oh, well, they couldn't make anything. All they could do is break something. If I see people have ripped off branches from the trees that have been planted, I think, well, there's, there's a failure to make anything there, to create anything there, to shape anything positively. All there is is someone ripping off a branch and damaging. That's, that's I think, what evil is like. You can trace this idea back to Augustine if you want to chase it up sometime. We'll ask about it later. All that sin and evil can do is take something good from God and twist it out of shape. Now, if it is true, 
I don't know if I've convinced you or not, we can think about it more, but if it is true that evil cannot make things but only break, that actually gives us a handy thought tool, a handy tool of thinking. Say, for example, that you as a Christian want to assess something. You want to assess your work, or we want to assess our work. Uh, we want to th think about the newest movie or book that's out there. We want to even think about our own speech patterns, our own communication and behaviours like that. Well, here's the test for evil. Does this thing, this action, this speech, does this thing celebrate what is good or does it pervert what is good? That's our little test. Does this, this thing celebrate what is good or does it pervert that which is good? So that's a little test. Uh, do we use speech that builds or do we use speech that destroys? Uh, are we having a, a productive and useful and well-earned rest or are we going slipping into useless laziness, for example? Um, do we have gifts of all sorts around about us that turn us towards thankfulness or do the gifts that we possess turn us towards pride instead and a perversion rather than a celebration? Can you, can you see how that test might work out? In Mark chapter 5, evil and sinfulness tried to destroy that man. Thankfully, evil failed because the man was made safe by Jesus. The man was made safe. The unclean destroyer failed in its attack on this human being. But because Jesus made him safe, let's have a look at Jesus because he's the destroyer of destroyers. Let's look at Jesus here. There's much, much we can say, but I really just want to focus in on one verse and make a brief comment there. Verse 7. Uh, when the demons speak, crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. What's going on here? The unclean spirit, or spirits, sometimes it's singular voice, sometimes it's plural, isn't it? But anyway, the unclean spirit recognises Jesus by name. The spirit seems to have some idea that there is Jesus around and that he might come and that he's in the world. The unclean spirit recognises Jesus by name, but more importantly, the unclean spirit recognises Jesus by his job, by the task that Jesus will do, will complete. Uh, Jesus is the one who will destroy evil. Like, have you come to torment us? The evil spirit knows that its time is limited, that its chance to break things and smash things and graffiti the world, to damage men and women and pigs, it, the, the evil spirit knows that that time is limited and will come to a sharp and painful end. And seeing Jesus, the spirit is terrified. It thinks, no, it can't be now, can it? it it's too soon, isn't it? Have you come to, to, to torment us? Are you going to break what we've got? The spirits think it's too soon, and Jesus actually knew it was too early as well. Jesus still had work to complete before that time of judgment, before that time of absolutely abolishing evil. Um, Jesus had plenty to do. But, but he knows, Jesus knows, that the Son of God is the one appointed to get rid of evil, to actually torment evil, that it may no longer exist. Jesus knows that his job is to obliterate evil. A judgment is coming against all the hurts and all the corruptions and all the perversions in this world. Do you ever look at the world and despair about the terrible things that happen? Do you ever pray that prayer of the psalmist, How long, O God? How long, O Lord? It's a good prayer to ask, especially when we are a bit down and when we are worried by evil. And here's the reminder that God will come, that Jesus is coming get rid of evil. The reminder, if you want to keep this in mind, the image of 2,000 dead pigs at the bottom of a steep, sleep, uh, steep slope. Jesus is coming to destroy evil. And there was a little foretaste of it on the western side, the eastern side, I should say, of the Sea of Galilee. Well, I began with talking about um, the bad news, the bad news of what evil is. And the bad news was important to consider because this man was certainly under the power of bad news, wasn't he? 
much under the power of evil and, and destruction. But I much prefer telling about good news. Um, so I will. And that's how we're going to finish. We're going to think about good news now. The good news is Jesus saves this man from evil. Because Jesus can save any man from any evil, any person from any corruption. That's good news, isn't it? Jesus saves this one man from evil because he can save any person from any wrong. This good news is life-changing news, world-altering news. And the man in the story here, he recognises that the good news changes his life and he wants to participate. He wants to leap straight into that change, doesn't he? You see that um, in verse 18 and 19 as Jesus is moving off. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with the demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. The man wants to get into the boat. He wants to be a follower of Jesus. He gets that there is a change. The man was right to want to follow Jesus. But a bit like the demons, the timing was a bit confused for the man. It's not yet the time when all demons and all evil will be abolished, even though Jesus shows here by adequate use of power that the time will come. And it's not yet the time for this man from the Gentile region across the sea to hop into a boat with Jesus and become his disciples. It will come. It will come not long after Easter, not long at all. But it wasn't yet that time. Jesus had work to complete, especially work in Jerusalem. Jesus had to take on the full power of evil by going to the cross himself. Their evil thought it had won and finally broken something that couldn't be fixed. Jesus on the cross did die and was buried, and yet he rose again from the tomb, proving that evil will not have the final victory. And from our perspective of Mark chapter 5, that was all ahead of Jesus. Uh, he had to die and rise to defeat evil forever, and so he had to finish that work before the man could join the boat, could jump in with the disciples, could be an everyday believer in Jesus like everyone else. Jesus had to finish his work in Israel before the time of Jews and Gentiles together was to really begin. It was a time that was going to come, the day of Jewish and Gentile unity, unity in the good news. That day was about to come, and not very, not very far in the future from our perspective here now, 2,000 years later. Um, but this man, this man was told to do something in the, in the interim. Do you see what he was told to do? Uh, go and tell of how much the Lord has done for you, and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Jesus used the word for Lord, the God has done for you, the, the Jewish term, I guess, for Lord. Go and talk about the Lord. So the bloke says, okay, it's not time for me to hop in the boat, but I'm going to go and I will talk about Jesus, <laughs> specifically about Jesus. This is a much better naming of Jesus, isn't it, than the demon naming him Jesus. This is a man who's had mercy on, poured upon him, who's had freedom given to him by Jesus. And he goes and speaks of Jesus in that region across the lake. You could say that this man, he's our model. He's our trainer. He's an example for us today uh, because he speaks the good news. He speaks his own testimony. You know what the Lord did for me? I'll tell you what the Lord did for me. And you know what the Lord did for me? He sent Jesus. And Jesus sent away evil. And Jesus restored me to my right mind, to society, to reality, to creation, to freedom and life. This man is a model for us because he spoke about Jesus. Not just the general words about God stuff or Lord stuff, but the very specific words about Jesus stuff. He's a model for us. He's a model for us. You know, if we get to have God talk with people, that's great. That's really nice. But if we get to have Jesus talk with people, that's the best thing of all. If, if we get to have spiritual conversations with people, as sometimes I hear it called and sometimes I've said the same, that's, that's good. That's fine. That's a, an interesting and useful and generally a caring step. But far better is to have a Jesus conversation with people. 
if we talk about blessings and good things and things to be thankful for, that's that's a really positive step and a useful thing. I encourage you to do it. But better than talking about blessings is Jesus' talk, because Jesus' talk is always the best. What did he do? What account, what history, what events of Jesus' life, what words from his lips do we want to share? That's the best thing. That's the best thing to do. Now, if you want to do some more Jesus' talk with me, I'd love to be part of that with you. Whether that's you inquiring or a friend with you inquiring, that's exactly what I love to do. Um, let's try and follow the example of this man who was one day raving and wandering through the tombs and harming himself and the next day it seems talking to everybody about Jesus. Let's follow that example and talk and listen about Jesus. What, what I reckon we should especially love to do in this day and age is to sit down and have a look at the Bible, look at Mark's Gospel with people one to one over a cup of coffee. Maybe even it might need one person sitting the south side of the border with Victoria and one person sitting on the north side, still in New South Wales. I'm sure we can do that. Whatever it takes, let's get together and organise hearing about Jesus through the Gospel of Jesus, through Mark's Gospel, which tells us about this great leader and king and bringer, bringer of peace, Jesus Christ. Now, you can do that, of course. You don't, you don't need me, you don't need experts to do it. But if I can help, then I'd love to help in any way possible. Let's, let's make Jesus talk happen. Let's pray for that and pray for opportunities. And let's use one another's strengths and expertise and experience to help in that. Well, that's enough for me now. We'll have time uh, for comments and questions in a moment. If you're uh, meeting with us at Zoom Church today, uh, we'll have some comments and questions. We'll also have breakout rooms in church today. But I'm going to wrap up in prayer now and um, uh, close this part of our looking at God's Word, but invite you to stay with us for a further conversation. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you that Jesus is your Son, the Son of the Most High, the one who has come to destroy the destroyers, to outdo evil by throwing evil out. We thank you that Jesus saved and had mercy on that man. And we thank you that that man was so trusting of Jesus, so in love with Jesus, that he could speak to him clearly around the whole region. And we pray that the name of Jesus will be spoken again and again and again in Albury and in Wodonga and all our houses and in all the region around here. We pray that the greatness of Jesus will be known by us personally, by our friends, by our neighbours. And we pray this because we know how good it is to know and trust Jesus our Lord. We thank you for that. Amen.